Hi there, fellow trackies, and welcome to my channel, The Scotch Tracker. Today I'm joined by my Discovery co-host, Marie Smith. Hi, Scotch Tracker. Shall we discover some art? That's apt, because today we're talking about the new reference book, The Art of Star Trek Discovery, with its authors, Terry J. Erdman and Paula M. Block. Hello there. <laughs> Husband and wife writing duo Paula M. Block and Terry Jer Erdman have written many Star Trek reference books, including the aforementioned new The Art of Star Trek Discovery. As well as these numerous guides, they have also written several DS9 ebooks. Welcome to the Scotch Trekker, Paula and Terry. It's great that you both could join myself and Marie, so thank you for participating. We wish we could be there in person. Yeah, we're, we're glad to do it. We're just <laughs> tra traveling, would be nice, yes. That would be lovely, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, first of all, from us both, congratulations on publishing this beautiful book. Um, the pictures, the sketches, the photographs, they are beautiful and give us a real insight into this great series. So can you tell us a little bit about the book? Basically, the assignment was to work on the art and of course, we're so used to doing behind the scenes books that we can't help asking questions in that direction too, even when we're talking to the artists and they don't seem to mind. Uh, one really refreshing thing about it was everyone that we talked to was delighted to talk. You know, I mean, even though they were super busy, I mean, they'd go out and they'd say, um, I'll call you back in 10 minutes and they go down to the set and then come back right away. But, uh, Everyone on the set for Discovery is a real trekker. And that was nice because, you know, on some of the productions in the past, sometimes the people weren't, you know, so, and it, and it really shows in what they do. Yeah, we were lucky in that we, we got the assignment from CBS television. Not from, well, well CBS told us that Titan was going to yeah, call C us. Yeah, CBS told us that Titan was going to call us. And, um, they gave us the uh, telephone numbers of the the department heads. So it was real easy for us to contact them. We had the phone numbers and we were surprised when we called them, they were happy to get our phone calls because they said they all owned our previous books. So while we, we were afraid we were calling these celebrities who were busy, they thought they were getting a phone call from celebrities. That's it was incredibly comfortable. It was yeah. very simple. It's yeah. a little different than from some of our other books because they haven't always been that way. They go, who are you again? Yeah, yeah well, sometimes we've had to call actors who are doing Star Trek for the first time and they don't know who we are and they're not even sure about that whole Star Trek world. They may not know the extent of the, the reach of fandom and, and that they're getting themselves involved in conventions. And, uh, but this time it was just real smooth. Cool. That's fantastic to hear. And I think we've heard these stories before about how they're looking to really bring the fans in, really be true to <laughs> canon and be true to the fans. So that's really right. good to hear. Right. Yeah, it, it is really nice. It, it's, uh, you know, we look at Twitter and Facebook a lot, and it was a little disheartening to see some of the trolls out there who said, this isn't really Star Trek, but, you know, I don't think they think anything is really Star Trek past 1969. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> on the other hand, those who've been around since then, you know, we just roll with it. Even, you know, there may have been one or two projects that we didn't like as much as other ones, but we just go with it, you know, yeah. because it's all evolution. You know? Yeah, one of the advantages of having gotten old is that we were around <laughs> in 1966 and 67 yeah. and, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it's old, it's more um, aged. Yeah, um, polished, primed, uh, yeah, we're, primed. We're, we're, seasoned. <laughs> yeah, seasoned, we are vintage, yes. Yeah. A vintage. Yes. <laughs> Scott Strecker, what, what questions have you got for Paula and Terry? Well, I was thinking the book's called The Art of Star Trek Discovery and includes many great images. So I was wondering, where did those pictures come from? Right. Oh. Uh, they came from a huge data file that they actually have there. Um, there was a woman in charge of all that stuff who I was in 
contact with all the time and she would keep loading more stuff and more stuff and more stuff into this and then they they gave me access to this database and it's actually the first time that i've been the photo editor for one of these books in the past um, i may have picked out some shots but they were given to me by somebody else um, or from the cbs library which which i started um, or something like that um, but in this case they just gave us access to the whole photo library and I just kept looking through it. It had a search function that wasn't the best in the world, but it worked pretty good. And, you know, so I'd look for things under the technical name for the effect. And, you know, I'd find things under that. I'd look under character names. I'd look under episode names. And I would just start, keep getting these images. And whenever they looked good, I would download them into my computer. And that's the point when I, I mentioned this uh, the other day, my computer started saying, I don't have room for this. You're going to have to throw out everything, all your personal photos, if you want this stuff. So I just, I bit the bullet and I paid Apple for more space <laughs> in their, uh, in their cloud area. So uh, on many of our previous books, uh, most of the photography was shot by a guy with a camera on the set. The still photographer would have a limited budget, so on The Next Generation or Deep Space Nine, the still photographer would only be on the set one or maybe two days a week. But now they're shooting everything all the time, everything's digital, there's no, you know, there's no negatives that have to be, you had to pay for, for uh, processing the film before, now it's just there in the camera. So where there used to be hundreds of pictures, there are now literally hundreds of thousands of pictures. And so like when we, we did a book called um, Star Trek Costumes mm -hmm. and uh, we went down to Paramount or to CBS, excuse me, and uh, looked through their photo archives and spent, you know, three weeks thumbing through pictures, you know, sheets of slides. And remember what a slide was? And um, picking up pictures. And there were literally there were only a, you know there's a, a number of thousands of them but here Paula was just flipping through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures. It was an entirely new and different process. Yeah, and we were getting new things all the time. Um, in the end, uh, we found we had a couple holes that we wanted to fill in for subjects we had chosen to write about. And uh, in that case, we put through a request to CBS who would pass it on to the effects department. And they actually, in some cases, did uh, grabs for us. Because, uh, for example, the shot of when the Discovery meets the Enterprise for the first time in the last episode of season one, there was no visual for that. No one had done a still of it or anything. And I thought that's such an iconic moment. You know, it gave everybody who watched the show a chill, you know. We had to have it, you know. So I put in a special request, please <laughs> do a grab of that. I need it. So the uh, special effects department did that picture specifically for us, even though it had been in the air, but the only other way to get it would be to, to, yeah. to, to shoot a picture of your television screen. Yeah. So, um, so they were that cooperative that it actually took them some time and a little money to produce photos for us that before we would have just gotten from a slide somewhere. Yeah, um, it, and they would send us the digital of it and, you know, if it needed a little mm -hmm. bit more sharpening or something, because sometimes if it was in motion, it wasn't quite sharp enough, but yeah, but they, uh, they were good about getting us everything we needed. Um, um, That's good. So. We were very happy. Yeah, the department has all of those artists. They turned out to be just really friendly, really nice people. You know, whether or not they wanted to be in the book, we never we never said, are you excited about being in a book? We just said, we're writing this book. And they said, what do you need? Just yeah, like that. a number of them were excited. They kept writing to us afterwards and saying, here, here's some more images I just found. And they'd send us all their drawings. Really, it's, too, it's too late, but we'd get more. Yeah, yeah or, they'd, or we'd replace other ones with them. 
that kind of leads me into a question that I've got because I was I was going through the book and there's all these names that were sort of falling out the book. You've got Jonathan Frakes, you've got Gersha Phillips, you've got Glenn Hetrick, right. all these interviews that you did. Yeah. And I was wondering who you were most excited about interviewing yourselves. <laughs> well, we've known Jonathan for, years. I don't know, for, 40 years we've known Jonathan Frakes. So we, I mean, if we wrote a book about, you know, the, the evolution of, of granite in some rock quarry somewhere, we'd call Jonathan. That, you know, <laughs> Just because I mean, we like to talk to him and ask right. his opinion. Yeah, we talk to Jonathan every book that we do. It doesn't matter if he's involved or not. He's right. a great interview. He's a, he's a wonderful interview. He's such an, you know, amazing guy. But I mean, we were very excited to talk to Gersha Phillips and Glenn Hendrick and and, and I mean, every one of these department has, some of these artists are so excellent. Yeah. You know, and we talked to John Eaves, we've talked to him in the past. A lot of these people we know, like John Eaves, we knew from Star Trek in the past, so. Yeah, well, I find it exciting that John Eaves worked on Deep Space Nine, and now he's working on Discovery, and that's a long career within the franchise. So we, we really like that. Yeah. That's, that's really that sounds really nice because you were not only doing this to get the end result but you can quite clearly see that you were enjoying you mm -hmm. were looking forward yeah. to it you were enjoying yeah. the process so that's that's really nice there's a scotsman working on oh, the yes. show yes and uh our contact at cbs said you have to talk to this guy just because you'll enjoy his accent the, <laughs> he does all the storyboards the storyboard artist McCallum is uh, Robert he, McCallum. Yes, yeah. and he has he has a really really heavy Scottish accent, and he, he gets a kick out of the fact that people sometimes can't understand what he's saying. So he was teasing us with that. So we, you're not the first Scots people that we've we've had this conversation with. Well, actually, I'm I'm Scottish, but Marie's English. Yeah, I can't oh, always yeah. understand. Yeah, no, you, that's right. It, <laughs> And we have no accent, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is one question my dad actually asked. And he was wondering, is there a reason why the book has the dimensions it's got? Why is the book square? We have no idea. When okay. we, we, yeah. we, we do a lot of interviews and, you know, and then we write the text. And in this case, we collected all the art. We always see all the art, but sometimes it's, it's d different ways of getting it. Here we collected all the art. Paula really worked with it. And then we sent it into Titan and they came out with the square book. Why the dimensions are like that, we don't know. We have several other books that have, and they're shaped like bricks and things. Not our fault. We, we, <laughs> we, we have nothing to do yeah. with that. You know, and in fact, uh, we didn't realize how large this book was going to be. And uh, they actually came back to us, the editor came back in the end and gave us a list of images that she needed higher res versions of because they were going to blow them up so big and oh, you know and actually i've looked at some pages in the book and i went oh that's just on the edge of getting grainy there <laughs> but, i mean there's some amazing shots that are double page yeah yeah pages. yeah i mean yeah. they're stunning yeah yeah so yeah. kind but, of leading on from that what was it like to first hold this book we went to our front door two or three times a day to see we're, if ups had dropped yeah, it off <laughs> we're never sure whether it's being shipped to us we 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 have a certain number in our contract that titan would send us and we knew that they would be coming a little bit late um so we ordered one from amazon britain we ordered one from target which is a big american department store we ordered one from Barnes and Noble, which yeah. is a big, you know, book a, a store. bookstore. Chain. And we ordered one from Amazon in the U.S. In the United States. Just so because we wanted to see how fast those would be coming to standard people who were ordering them. So for every, every day for like three weeks, we went and looked at the, you know, outside the door to see if anything had been delivered. You know, three or four times a day, we go, oh, darn, there's nothing there. We were excited. We were waited and waited. And then all of a sudden, they all came within about four or five days. They all came. Yeah. And the waiting was made worse by the fact of COVID. 
COVID-19, <laughs> because we actually finished the book and turned everything in, the text and most of the images to them last September. The, uh, book, 2019. the book originally was scheduled to be released in June of 2020. Yeah, and that they figured <laughs> would give them plenty of time mm -hmm. to do all the work on it. And then bam, come March, everything shut down. Yeah. You know, yeah, the, all the companies, the publishing company shut down. And then after that, we had to deal with the fact that the factories that produce the book over in China, which is where everybody gets their books printed these days, those were shut down too, you know, yeah, so, it, so we're waiting. Yeah, right? so it delayed everything by six months. So we also waited those six months. <laughs> but it's, um. But actually, I think it turned out nicely because now they're all coming out in time for Christmas. And a lot of our, our friends on Facebook are saying, oh, this is great. I'm going to tell so-and-so that I want this for Christmas. Yeah, well, one, one of the artists, a young lady uh, who lives in Toronto, uh, wrote us an email one day and said, uh, it's the only Christmas gift I'm giving to anybody. Everybody gets a book. <laughs> okay. So um, one question I was wondering if was, if you had the opportunity to include information from the third season of Discovery, would you have um, appreciated that? Oh yes, we love third season, and and it is it's it's even prettier. You know the the idea of this of this art book was to try to make it really nice to look at, but season three has been just gorgeous. So yeah, yeah. I wouldn't mind having uh, some of those. And we've actually. You know, I've frozen a few of them on our screens. Well, Alex so we can look Kurtzman at told us when we interviewed him that his goal in taking on Discovery was to make a TV series like a movie, you know, yeah. and put the money into it that you do. Because, you know, on all the other TV shows, we were very acquainted with the fact of, oh, God, we can't spend, we can't spend more than a couple hundred thousand dollars per episode, so we can't get super duper things. But Alex said, no, we're going to make fewer episodes, but we're going to put a lot more money into it. And so the effects are just stunning, you know. Yeah, one of his, I mean, he, he really stressed it the number of times that the subject came up. Um, Alex, who's the executive producer, um, really, he said he wants to erase the, the difference, the space between feature film and television look. He, he wants to make it all one look, and he's working on and it. ironically with the COVID breakout and the fact that more and more people are turning to streaming um it's kind of it was a good idea at the time and it worked out to be very good because the people who are sitting at home watching their tv sets instead of going to the movies they're getting to see this stuff in really high quality visuals yeah and i read something up uh, we didn't do the research on this because it wasn't part of the book, but I've read that they've changed their sets so that they can do quite a lot of stuff. The sets are all built extensively. They have, I don't know, curved walls so that they can actually work with the visuals at the same time they're shooting. And Yes, in the book, you'll see a number of pages that show the green screen, the stage is surrounded by green screen. They have much more of that now. They've really built it up on the... And we were going to go to the sets. We were invited to come up whenever we want. And then COVID hit, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Maybe next year. Well, it's, it's filming season four at the moment, isn't it? I know. Yes, it is. I know. And there are still people online saying, oh, it was canceled after season two. Yeah, we get, we get, <laughs> we get a kick out of that. Every, every day you hear that. You know, Alex kurtzman has been fired about seventy-five times. You know, as many times as as many times as Joe Biden's been elected. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got a couple of favorite parts of the book, if that's okay, that I'd love to talk to you about. Sure. So one of them was the section. It's called "How the Kelpian Got His Face," mm -hmm. and it's the journey of Saru and what they wanted to do originally. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because I loved the, the artwork for that. I loved the story about that. We talked to, to Brian Fuller, who was the original creator, the, creator, the star, Alex, story yeah. writer of the series. And he didn't stay with it very long. He was only around for about half of the first season. Um, he wanted to make 
what we call the flying V guitar. You know what, a, a Gibson guitar with this big, you know, it, it's got a V-shaped body and uh, put all these eyes on it and give this character dozens of eyes. Um, and they would all have to be worked on with through visual effects because they'd all have to blink and they'd have to have meaning in order and, to look and, real right and they'd have to actually have emotion in each of the eyes and stuff and um it was a wonderful idea and we we they gave us pictures glenn Hetry gave us a bunch of pictures of what they had and we interviewed brian and he explained to us why he wanted to do it and all of that um but then after they were getting into it they realized that doing all the visual effects work on those eyes would take extra days, would take a bunch of extra visual effects people. They'd have to have a puppeteer and a visual effects person the on, on the set yeah. at all times, you know, extra employees. And then they would need a few days to do the visual effects work after production. It was going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they finally, it, it was actually a cost and time factor that made them not do it. But we thought it was a really good idea. Yeah, and, and yeah. when they first started having problems wondering how are we gonna do this, Glenn uh, Hetrick said he started advocating for let's do something similar because he really liked, uh, he liked Saru as a character and he wanted to be able to see him and see the actor as he was. Right. He said, it's a shame to put that amazing actor because Doug Jones is, you know, he's not just. He's done so many yeah. memorable roles. And, and he could have, if he hadn't, if he wasn't so tall, he probably <laughs> would have been cast as a, as a leading man in different types of movies. And um, he's so good that it's a shame to always cover him up, but we've never seen him un uncovered really. <laughs> so, but, uh, so this is, I think his first project where he really shines as a character because the other ones, you know, he doesn't get many lines. It's all about the visual look of him. Oh, I liked him as a fish. <laughs> So it's it's really great to see him in this. Yeah. Emoting yeah. and yeah. yeah and now he's our captain. So how wonderful yeah. is that? Yeah. I know. And oh, it's, that's nice. And it's so nice to watch how he does everything. You know, I think they they do imitations of the Saru walk because as he walks, these long arms kind of swing back and forth, and it's very cute. Yeah, I noticed um, that section. Um, one face, one civilization, which I wondered might be a reference to the Queen song One Vision, uh, likens the earliest design of Saru's face to a flying V electric guitar. Um, <laughs> through, I think that's also, coincidental. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we hadn't thought of that. That's very All good right. at your part. You know, we, yeah. if, if you said that to us before, we're gonna get, we could have given you credit in the back of the book for giving us the idea. I mean, we tried to put as many sort of pun type titles in the book the book also includes sections called every picture tells a story don't it on the back and black yeah. are these sure, referencing yeah. rod stewart song and well, that one is. Song <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, and was that, there a particular person who thought of adding the musical references yeah well yeah. that that was deliberate <laughs> yeah no we we like to uh we, We've done a lot of these books. I mean, this is like number, we, the, we, I don't know. We, we, we don't even know. You know, we've done some ghost writing on other projects, things that aren't Star Trek, don't ask. <laughs> um, but um, we've done so many of these books, we, all, we, we have to entertain ourselves rather than have it be hard work. So we always try to make something humorous and we try to make them educational. We always think, you know, somewhere in some small town, you know, hidden behind a rock on a farm, some kid who thinks he has no choice in life but to milk cows for the rest of his life. Um, we like to give them a little bit of a hint on how they could get into doing visual effects, writing the music, um, you know, become a cameraman. And uh, so we always try to put a little bit of humor and a little bit of education. I, I should have been a school teacher. 
And so we put that into every one of our books. Whether it shows up, we don't know, but that's what we try. Well, and we also try to entertain ourselves. And we know that when we read a book, we appreciate, you know, something that's a nice turn of phrase or a twist or something, yeah. you know. We discuss this a lot. Neither of us knows how we learned to write. It just sort of accidentally happened. In fact, we discussed this even more. Neither of us knows how we learned to read. Both of us, when we entered first grade, you know, at the age of six, or Paula went to yeah. kindergarten even at five, we already knew how to read. And, uh, we, and we don't have any recollection of our parents no. teaching us, but they obviously must No, have. no, my parents could not have taught me how to read. But when I was six years old, I was reading. I have a brother who was in the third grade when I entered the first grade. And I was reading his books when he was in the third grade. And I don't know wh where I learned how to read. So the fact that we're writers is, is, is sort of automatically came to us, but we don't know how or why. <laughs> It just you seemed know. meant to be. But on top of that, we love Star Trek. So we're glad it's there for us to write about. You know? mm. So um, leading from that, how, how did you start writing um, about Star Trek? Well, uh, OK. Um, I decided I wanted to be a writer at a very young age because my mm. mother used to take me to the library every week. And I decided that I wanted to be one of those people who had their name on the side of a book on the binding, you know, I wanted to have my name there. So, you know, you have to write something to do that. So I always knew that was what I wanted to do. Um, so I kind of geared my career towards things that would let me write. And uh, my first job after I got out of school was at an editorial assistant um, at a news agency. And that moved on to the news agency was owned by uh, McGraw Hill, a big magazine publishing house and textbooks and things like that. And eventually they decided they liked my stuff enough that they transferred me to the New York office to become an editor out there. So I was doing lots of different things and uh, lots, and then, you know, got, got into doing a lot of freelance on things like automobiles and medicine and physical physician and sports medicine and biotechnology, all things I knew nothing about. <laughs> but I, I learned um, quickly that if you can write a coherent sentence, it's all a matter of just putting in the different nouns and verbs. You have to look those up to see what they look, what they're supposed to be. But if you can put the sentence down, then you just have to figure out what goes in the blanks. So. Um, so I wrote for a long time about things I knew nothing about. But, uh, and then one day after I moved to Los Angeles to be with Terry, um, <laughs> Terry was working in publicity and marketing for the motion picture departments of studios all over Hollywood. And he worked on Star Trek V. And uh, after the movie was over, he had made friends with, you know, the whole, publicity department and the marketing department, which worked very closely together. And uh, they asked him, in his opinion, if he knew anybody who knew something about Star Trek and also knew something about publishing. And <laughs> I remember I, we were sitting in the office together. I was working on some stupid freelance story. And Terry all of a sudden got a big grin on his face. And he says, yeah, I think I might know somebody. And he turned around and looked at me. And uh, he sent me in for an interview. And then I, I always tell people working for Paramount Pictures, editing Star Trek materials and, and handling that, uh, that area of their department was the only job I ever was prepared for. <laughs> The only job I ever knew anything about when I got into it. It sounds like a dream job. It was a dream job for her. She had she was in an office. Um, well, I see you. Ha you have a wall of books over here behind. We have a wall of books over here behind us. Her office at Paramount, because she became director of publishing, um, was bookshelves like that on all sides and full of books. And one day a fellow came in, he walked in, he looked around and he looked at Paula and he said, you must like to read. And I looked at him like, 
<laughs> it was such a dumb question, yeah. but uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't? But yeah. I guess he didn't. <laughs> well, I, I want to confess something here. I, I have not really told this to a lot of people. Um, I was, I got out of college and I went over to the Warner Brother lot and I went, you know, knocked on the, the human resources door and went and took a typing test and got into the secretary, floating secretarial pool. And I got assigned to a producer who liked me and who took me over to 20th Century Fox. And I met all the marketing people and then I got a job as a publicist at 20th. Um, and then one of the executives from 20th went over to Paramount Pictures and called me after a few months and said, would you like to be the unit publicist on the next Star Trek movie? That's the, the person who spends all the time on the set and takes notes about how it's been. And well, yeah, my head blew up. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I did, and that's how I got into Star Trek. But at the time, and that this movie was Star Trek V. So we're talking about, uh, there was, the original series three seasons there were about two or three seasons of the next generation yeah. already made this is the fifth motion picture and i knew nothing about star trek i i knew nothing about star trek but that's when he realized and, he had a resource and, 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 and paula and i were together at that time and i looked at her and i said um i think you're gonna have to help me out what took me you know and a few weeks later i was on a private plane with with bill shatner and leonard nimoy and harv bennett flying up to yosemite so i had to do a real crash course in what in the world is this star i mean i knew what spock was and i'd heard beam me up scotty but i didn't know much and now people call me you know we've seen in in print in magazines it says you know star trek historians paul block and terry you know so i've learned a lot about it since you know yeah, and, and to, yes do you have questions i can answer to answer questions. your original question about how we got into star trek writing or writing in general um after uh Star Trek V, and after I'd been in the job at Paramount for a while, I got to know the editors at the different publishing houses real well. And one of them called me up and he said, listen, I know you can't work on any of the books because you work for the studio, but um, I know your husband does these press kits for all these movies. And, and I had sent him some of the press kits because they had information about Star Trek that the publisher could use. And he says, he seems to be, be a pretty good writer. Do you think he could handle a book for us? And I said, yeah, sure. So uh, he called Terry and Terry got the assignment for the Deep Space Nine companion. So, which I, which I ended up working on also. I, but, I, I had worked as a publicist on, on a whole bunch of movies, but, you know, and I turned out these production notes, you know, you know what a press kit is, so there's a, it used to be a stack of pictures, now it's all digital, but, you know, and then a little booklet of information. I wrote lots and lots and lots and lots of those. So I had, you know, honed my skills as a writer. And- uh, um, So the format is actually pretty similar to yeah. what we do for these books because he got very used to uh, talking to everybody on the set from the actors to the people who- Behind do, the scenes people. Yeah. Um, and he got very comfortable talking to those people and asking questions that the common man would want to know in order to understand the process. And that came in, in handy for when we started doing these books. Yeah, but I had never written anything, maybe 25 pages, maybe, you know, maybe two, 3,000 words. Um, and the term way, papers. <laughs> yeah, term papers. <laughs> and... Uh, the uh, but the Deep Space Nine Companion, you know, it's that thick. It actually has it has four hundred and fifty three thousand and ninety eight words in it, wow. and that's the first the first book that I got involved. And then halfway through the Deep Space Nine Companion, Margaret Clark, who was an editor, Simon and Schuster, called me and said, "Set it aside. I need you to write." And we did a book called Star Trek Action, and it got published and sold, and then um, the, the Secrets, uh, of the Star Secrets Trek Insurrection. Insurrection, the behind the scenes book on Insurrection, you know, wrote that and it got published and sold. And the Magic and of then Tribbles. And the Magic of Tribbles, <laughs> which is, it, it was gonna be a paperback, but it's only online now, you know. Yeah. Um, and that got published and online 
And then we finished the Deep Space Nine Companion. So by the time we finished my first book assignment, it was book number four. You'd already published three more. And, yeah. And, yeah. and I, I, I had graduated beyond writing 25 page pieces. You know, yeah. now it was yeah. a lot of words. Yeah. And I actually co wrote with him on all those things, but I wasn't allowed to put my name on things for several years because it seemed like, you know, it would have been, uh, I'm the director of publishing for Paramount, and all of a sudden I'm writing half of the books, you know. So, yeah. For the first couple of our books, you'll see it's it's usually just Terry's name with uh, with help from Paula Block. Yeah, one of the, one of the Deep Space Nine companions says with Paula Block, yeah. and the uh, the other ones, a number of them, your name isn't on. I'm a consulting yeah. writer, or consulting but editor, wrote, or whatever. But I did the. Um, the coffee table companion book for the Tom Cruise movie, um, The Last Samurai, and you didn't help me. No, that's true. So that's my book alone. That one he wrote by himself. Yeah. But everything else we wrote together yeah. and we discovered we really work very well together um, because we always see things from a different viewpoint. And uh, the usual process is one of us takes a first crack at it. The other one gets it and says, ah, <laughs> terrible and and rewrite it and then the first one goes ah you're crazy you ruined it yeah and then the third version is usually perfect and when we go back we can't remember who wrote what in yeah it. yeah we write we're, we're the entertainment columnists for our local newspaper in the little town where we live and we do that all the time one of us will have it's a monthly you know we have we have 30 days to write 600 words it's really a big it's really a task <laughs> But uh, one of us will have an idea to write about, you know, a motion picture or a TV show or a musical act that's going to come into town or something. And, you know, just write 600 words, give it to the other person. And every time we just get into the, oh, there's a, you know, but <laughs> back and forth. But the third time, it's always perfect. We're always really excited about how it sounds. It's evidently a partnership that's worked. Yeah. No, for the book, some for yourselves. 35 years. 35 years we've been, we, and we have, we've worked together other than when she was going into the studio or when I would go out on the road for four months, you know, on a movie set, I did G.I. Jane with the Moore and, and uh, I don't know, Father of the Bride with Steve Martin and, they, you know, I'd be out of town for a while. But other than those periods, we have been this close together nonstop for the most of 35 years. We, we've never been out of, we, we both go to the grocery store. You know, we've, we've just always been together. We just kind of like each other. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> you were talking about like how you plan books and stuff like that. I was wondering, um, how did you decide the way that this book would be separated into chapters? Paula did it. Question. Uh, oh, the, the sections for the, the book. Sections for the book. Yeah. Uh, it was tough. You know, as we started writing, we realized, okay, this is going to have to be divided up. Mm. And we just kind of, I kind of just arbitrarily said, okay, we've got a lot of material on this, and we've got a lot of material on that. So, mm. you know, so we just kind of took a chance on it, and it all worked, you know. So, yeah, I we were mean, lucky. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would be sitting sort of waiting for her to give me an assignment. And she would say, you know, how about the Kelpian wardrobe? And so I'd say, okay, and jump into it. But she, I didn't know that she'd even put together a, you know, a costume section, an alien section, yeah. a, you know, whatever it is. Well, there was yeah. a you know, one of the sections, um, elaborate sets and exotic locales. <clears throat> That was just because um, we had a number of really gorgeous photographs. You know, these beautiful pictures of the actors walking through the desert and walking down sand dunes, you know. And I thought, we've got to say something about these because otherwise we have no reason to use them. And that was how that section came about. So the material that the studio sent to us that we had to use Di sort of dictated how the book came out. We had a lot of uh, location pictures. We did a location section. We got a bunch of wardrobe stuff. We did a wardrobe section. 
Um, this is the first book we've ever done, even with the ghostwriting stuff that we're not talking about, um, that we didn't interview the actors. I mean, we've always interviewed. Yeah. I, I still have tapes laying here with, you know, Tom Cruise and Demi Moore and Tina Turner and obviously Leonard Nimoy and Bill Shatner and, and, and much, much, much Jonathan Frakes. But uh, we did not speak to any of the actors on this book and of, I don't know, there's 35 things with our mm -hmm. names on the title. Um, this is the first time we've ever not interviewed the cast. Yeah. Oh. I, I suppose, even though obviously there's the, there's so many photos and and sort of uh, sketches and pictures of the cast, you know, there's yeah. pictures of Saru. Well, Michael. we met, you know, we mentioned their names, but, but we didn't have the, the the person on the telephone. Yeah, it's not actually about them; it's about oh. the concept, <clears throat> isn't it? Yeah, it's about how they look or what they're wearing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? The art, yeah. the art. So I told you about my favorite part, which was the Saru section. Yeah. What's, mm -hmm. what's your favorite part of the book? Is there a little section that no, that's you... A, that's so toughy. Um, the one thing that I insisted on, I mean, we were almost finished and I realized that we didn't have that shot from you know, the last frame of season one when the Enterprise comes up and the, the, the Discovery crew looks out their view screen and they say, it's the Enterprise. It's the USS Enterprise. I still feel the chills that I felt when it happened when I first saw it. You know, I feel the joint chills that all of us people around the world who saw it all said, oh my God, the Enterprise. Um, we didn't have that picture. So I went after it, you know, I called CBS and then we talked to a couple of people from the visual effects department, CBS talked to them and it took, it took a while, it was like six weeks where finally, I mean, they said they would get to it and they would try to do it all. And then finally they said, here's your picture. That's my favorite thing in the book. Cause I, it, it was actually the only thing that was a lot of work and a lot of worry and a lot of concern to get. Everything else just kind of fell into place. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of like the last uh, chapter about changing the game just because it's, it's a hodgepodge. It's just a bunch of things didn't have a place to put it in, but just said, okay, we'll just put it all here, you know, and how do you make the uh, Vulcans look and how do you do anything else, you know, so it was, it was just fun. And uh, that last picture in the book of, of, of Burnham and Spock touching hands, you know, uh, that didn't exist either. So that was another special request, especially when we interviewed Alex and he said, that was one of his favorite shots in the second season was the two of them touching hands. I said, well, I don't have that. <laughs> so that was another request too. But, you know, we liked everything, anything there was a cool photograph for. When, when you start writing, I mean, there's two parts of the book. There's actually the, the, the photography, which a lot of people only look at. And then there's the text, which is dearer to us because we create that, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and hopefully some people read it. Well, when you, first, when you start writing a book, you put a blank piece of paper in the typewriter or the blank screen nowadays, and um, you stare at it. And it's, you know, it's a blank page. So I like, I think my favorite thing to write is the very opening of the book when we say, how do you launch a new Star Trek TV show? And we wrote about Michael Burnham, laughing <laughs> and i i think of the of the writing part even though it's just you know it's only 300 words or something and it's the very opening of the book. I think that's my favorite writing in the book because yeah. it was just a way to a way to get going. And then after yeah. we did that, we just flew. And the idea for that came to me while I was trying to fall asleep one night. I was thinking, how the hell are we going to do this? And I just thought of, you know, well, how do you start a series? And I thought, oh, it's the same way you start a book. <laughs> 
And that again, I wanted to find, I never did get exactly the photo I wanted for that. I wanted the photo of her laughing as she's out in space because she looks around and she just laughs because she's enjoying yeah. herself so much. But you know, so the closest we got to that was a picture of her it, smiling from that it, scene. It would have had to be a, fi a frame grab. And, and they, she just moved too much. And they, and they never, frame grabs never look as good as a photograph or some, you know. So um, we didn't do it. We intentionally didn't do any photographs, any no, frame grabs in the book. Oh, there's a couple of yeah. them. Yeah. If there's something that doesn't exist, but uh, we tried to use artwork yeah. Yeah. or photographs yeah. rather than frame grabs. You know? Yeah. So, but but we enjoyed it. It was all fun. Oh, it's always and, fun. And you know, and the thing that actually that we wrote the first was how they did the credits for the show because well, not first. because yeah because i just loved the credits even before we knew we were going to do that book do you hear our dogs barking <laughs> i was wondering who was trying to join in are they big trek fans yeah they are uh, they're two collies and they're just very vocal yeah scottish dogs but... yes scottish dogs but uh no, I, we just loved those opening credits. And there were things like some of the images, I wasn't quite sure what it was, you know. And I thought, what is that? And I thought, you know, I wish somebody would write an article about that so I could read it and find out, you know. So when we got the assignment, first thing I did was find out who did the credits so I could and, ask them. Yeah, she wrote the article that she wanted to read. Somebody wrote it. Eventually, somebody wrote it. Well, yeah, I mean, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So um, the credits end with um, the famous um, Alexander uh, Courage yeah. Uh, yeah. in June. Um, there's wonderful. quite a few, quite a few references in the book to, to how the original series has inspired design aspects yeah. and discovery. Um, and so, like the dry dock from the ocean picture inspired the dry dock in Such Sweet Sorrow Part sure. 2. What are your personal favorite Easter eggs that have been included in Star Trek Discovery? Well, uh, those are some of them. Um, I, we did a whole section on Easter eggs that showed up in the mm -hmm. early part of the show when Lorca first shows Burnham how the uh, spore drive works. Hold tight. Blink, you're in the Lari. Blink, the moons of Andoria. Blink, you missed Romulus. All those planets, all those places, all those species seen and yet to be seen. And you're holding like it never happened. That was kind of a fun thing. It was fun for them, even though, you know, when he's saying, and this is this, and this is that, they weren't actually that. If you know the original series, you know, Hey, wait, I recognize that. That's not what he's saying it is. But they did it just for the fun of it. And similarly, when they got to Saru's planet, the big obelisks that they had on the planet for the other alien species, um, the art director decided to base it on the obelisks in the Star Trek episode. Um, the Paradise Syndrome. Yeah, yeah, Paradise Syndrome. Correct. Yeah, very good. So you, you should, he, he's you're better good. on original series than I am. I, um, interestingly, there was a while when the, the, the original series motion pictures were being made where a rule was they never used the Alexander Courage theme. Mm -hmm. and, and I never knew why. And I, I talked to the producers on Star Trek V because I was there all the time. Um, and um, they really didn't explain it. They just said, oh, we try to get away from that a little bit. So I'm really happy that with Discovery, they use it thoroughly. It shows up every time the Enterprise is there. Yeah, it's, but, it's not, in the credits. but they don't use it gratuitously. They no, use they, it when it's going to really give you a nice punch yeah. in the heart. Yes. So for a while it was like verboten, but today it's back. And I yeah. really think it's a good idea. It works yeah. for me. Yeah. I mean, 
it was nice. We liked all of that stuff. You know, they, like I said, they know their stuff. And I really like the music that Russo is doing for the show. Mm -hmm. um, it's Russo. very melodic. I love his use of instrumentation, you know. It's mm -hmm. really nice. Um, the book includes script excerpts such as on pages 89, 93, and 122. Were you given access to full scripts or just those extracts? Oh, we got them all. <laughs> oh, we got the script. That's another thing that took up space in my computer. You know, I had access to where all the scripts were, plus all the versions of it. You know, the green mm. version done on September 3rd and the purple version done on October 4th, you know. And so you could see how they changed as it went along. That's how I found out um, the description of Saru from the first script, because that actually got sent to us by um, Brian. By oh. Brian. Brian yeah. sent us a couple of those. So yeah. it was really nice. Uh, Brian was great to us, but we had worked with him before um, when we did some articles about Voyager. Yeah, and he, he was did on, a little bit on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, too. he was on staff on Voyager before he created So we knew him and we asked if he'd like to work on this uh, with us, even though he wasn't working on the show anymore. He said, sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so yeah. We well, yeah, yeah. You know, he goes on to project after project after project. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it, it took us a little while to set up a, a day and date with him. But, uh, you know, once yeah. he got it, we got it. So mm -hmm. that was good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, page 100 features a graphic from the Short Tracks episode Calypso. And some of the pages about the design of Kaminar discuss the Short Tracks outing the brightest star. There's even a short two page section called Short Tracks, not so random pieces of the puzzle. So what was the thought process behind including art and content from sources out with Discovery? Uh, for short trucks? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, was, that was actually interesting. Uh, we didn't, because we were watching the show for the first time as the stuff aired, we didn't realize those were going to end up being pieces that were going to be used later on. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talked to Alex, um, he mentioned that, that they had had that in mind from the beginning. So we didn't know that this crazy girl that Tilly runs into in the first one. Mihani ika halikapo. Oh, okay. Can you actually just go to the beginning and just very slowly? Po. Po. Okay, Po. We didn't know she was going to turn up in the last episode of the second season. They have a refracted lattice shield design. You can see it in the wave patterns. They can't be defeated one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but that was kind of interesting. And and right now people are talking about, gee, how does Calypso relate to what's going on on the show now? We're, we're kind of seeing right. how the <laughs> ship's computer has evolved or is starting to evolve into that character Zora that was in Calypso. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's a lot of speculation about, well, what's <laughs> going to happen that the crew is going to abandon the discovery somewhere 9,000 years from now? I've come up with a key phrase. People, people will figure out how to, to, um, to Facebook us or Twitter us, which is wonderful. We welcome it. Please do. Um, but um, they'll all say, uh, you know, how is the, uh, you know, where are the Klingons? Or how is Calypso going to work into 900 years in the future? Yeah. Or, you know, things like that. And I answer every time I say, patience. Yeah, really. <laughs> we don't know either, we but no we're idea. sure it'll show up. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, but hang on, you know, just, just patience. Yeah. So I, I have literally in the last two months probably typed just the word patience. Probably, probably 50 times. Yeah. It's lovely to see that you're both enjoying this new series as well. That oh, I love it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely love it. It's, it's just, a lot of fun. It's just fabulous. So, well, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's so, it's kinky. All of a sudden, there's this red angel. What in the world is this red angel going to be? It turns out, to, well, can we use spoilers here? Of course, it's been around a long time, yeah. right? You know, it's 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 Michael's mother for crying. I mean, the, these surprises that come. I just think this stuff is really wonderful. I love this. We think the show is really well written. You know, if you were going to sit down and and, and analyze it from a logic point of view, you know, you're not quite sure where this story comes up or 
how this how they got away with that but it works in the context of the story and it's very fun the way it works in the context of the story so who cares yeah and, and you know they're 900 years in the future and these people should be so the people that they've met now should be so advanced and yet they seem to be the smartest ones i mean it doesn't <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really make sense but it works because they're our characters and we you know and i just of i absolutely love it i just love it of course they're smart yeah, yeah. it's saru for crying out yeah them. He's our but, captain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then, I mean, I, I do have one question. How does Saru's sister go from being, you know, a seaweed collector to a to a starship fighter pilot? Yeah, that in the up, final episode, she shows up with a bunch of other Kelpians yeah, yeah. and they're flying these ships and attacking the bad guys. And the, it, how did she get that yeah, level of It knowledge? happened a little quickly. I don't care, I like it. It's, <laughs> it's you know, that's the other thing. It's fiction. Oh my gosh, don't say yeah. that. People will get upset. And, <laughs> it, it just, you know, it, in the olden days, before I got involved with Star Trek as a profession, that was the type of thing that would inspire fanzines. You know, you'd find a moment in an episode that you thought was really cool and you couldn't explain it. So you did a story about it, explaining it. And that's how I got into writing Star Trek stuff, you know. I wrote stories about Dr. McCoy and what was actually happening behind the scenes. She had a crush on Dr. McCoy. He was cute. You didn't. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you guys working on next? Not now that the moment, down. At the moment, we're kind of happy to not be working yeah. on anything, but we know the phone could ring at yeah. any moment. Yeah, in 2008, we retired. We lived in Los Angeles. We're, we're in, in Oregon now, which is a state right north of California. And um, we, we retired. We quit the studios. We quit and moved up here to never do it again. And then the phone rang. And they said, you know, whoever called us first said they had a project. It was about this. And we had three questions. We asked, you know, what's the deadline? What's the word count? And what's the budget? You know, and those are the three things that are good for us. And mostly the budget about our budget. And um, we've turned down a bunch of them. And if we didn't know enough about the subject. Because... Yeah, we, we want the books to be about something that we have a feeling for and that we know about. Yeah, we've been offered a couple of books about uh, you know, Power a, Rangers, a, 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 a Saturday morning cartoon things and stuff like that. We don't know anything. So we recommend one of our friends and they've gotten other people done. But uh, but we we're retired. We don't do it. And then the phone rings and we'll accept a con you know, a, a concept from somebody we've done. I guess about six or seven books in the 12 years that we've lived up here retired. And um, right now we don't have an assignment, but tomorrow morning the phone could ring and if we like it, we'll take it. If, not, if it never happens again, yeah. we're perfectly happy. Yeah, we'd love to do a little more fiction. Mm -hmm. We really enjoyed doing those eBooks um, because you know we, we knew so much about Deep Space Nine from doing the Deep Space Nine companion that all of the characters on that show seem like friends to us. So when uh, Margaret Clark, that editor at Simon & Schuster called us up and asked us to do these stories from Quark's point of view, it was, it was fun. Yeah. You know, you just have to, Quark may not be our favorite character on the show, but it was easy to get into his mindset. Oh, his voice is real easy. But I mean, in, in a perfect world, we have all this time, we have this ability, we have connections and everything. We should be writing either, you know, the great American novel or some wonderful coming of age story or a series of mystery books or something. But honestly, we're too ignorant to figure out what to write about. We don't, we, we have no original stories between us. And we talk about it a lot, you know, we'll go sit, we'll sit in a bar, well, not anymore, but <laughs> you know, with a glass of wine with each other so, and, and come up with nothing. What's your name? Mar Margaret, you know, you give us a nugget. Yeah, Margaret called us and said, Quark had, there, there, was a, there was a holodeck program about this woman. Yeah, Vulcan and, Love Slave. Yeah, Vulcan Love Slave. That was on the show. That was in the they series. They mentioned just in passing yeah. reference. And she said, and, and, and Margaret, the editor, Sam Schuster said, Quark finds out that there's a sequel. 
and he wants to find the sequel. Can you guys write it? We said, sure. And we did. And we loved the book and it sold copy. You know, it's online only. But, uh, it, and it was really that much of a nugget, just a little thing like that. But we can't come up with them ourselves. We have, <laughs> we're just stupid. We, we you just. Know. You know, but, you know, you give us. You know, you give us a carrot, it's like a horse. You give us a carrot, we run. <laughs> you know, so. That's right. What's your plans after COVID? Are you going to go and do any traveling or are you going to? Yeah. yeah, we had just before COVID, we had a plan to do one of two things. We, either, we were either going to do UK, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, or we were going to buy a new car and drive around in a big circle around the United States, hit maybe 35, you know, go across the South and come around the North or the other direction and uh, stop at, you know, like a lot of national parks, but I call it a food trip because I want to eat again in New Orleans, eat, eat in San Francisco, eat in New Orleans, eat in, in Boston, eat, you know, and uh, one of those. And then, um, we had a couple things some friends got married on the east coast so we went to that wedding and that kind of took a little of the budget away but now i want to do that 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 brick trip i really want to do that breeze trip again i really do so maybe with that would be it you know? so have a convention and invite us well, destination star trek it was of it was due to be in November yeah. in London, but yeah. oh, well. you know, if we ever do it again, I mean, I'd like to come to, because I really want, I've never done the British Isles and I really like to do it. You know, so. yeah. yeah, people would love you over in England and Scotland yeah. and Wales. They would yeah, eat you up. <laughs> Golly. Gosh. <laughs> We're going to get big heads. Better than haggis. On page 124 of the book, you state that adding an Adorian to the Discovery Bridge crew was at one point a possibility. So do you know if this was where the character of Rin developed from in the show's third season? Well, I don't really know. But, um, but, but I wouldn't ima I, I, I would imagine, yes. I mean, they, they want to, if they spent the time and money to develop the makeup and come up with a look, they, mm -hmm. you know that they're going to use it sometime. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yes, I do believe and also, there were talk about making Saru blue. Yeah, and then that's they said, why they didn't. And then they, they didn't because they thought yeah. they might bring an Andorian in. So I think it's going to happen. Once, once again, remember? We don't know. Patience. Yeah. Patience. Yeah. And besides, he seems, the actor seems to be very into Star Trek himself. So I'm sure if they yeah. offer him a recurring role, right. I don't think he'll turn it down. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that some of the images don't have captions and some of the captions are more humorous than others. Uh, did you consider including captions for all the images and was aiming for the right tone between a factual and more comical one, a difficult balance to achieve? Uh, the captions are fun. Sometimes if there's no space, there's no caption. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, because the size of the book is limited, you know, but uh, I usually try to make my captions humorous if I can. We worked with an editor once who absolutely could not write and wanted to do the captions of a book and they were completely indecipherable. They so, were terrible. So we're pretty, you know, we're pretty possessive of our captions. And if they can be humorous, I think they should be. But, you know, in, in terms of the captions in here, um, they serve two purposes. They were for layout. Um, you know, they'd say, oh, you got to explain what's on these pages. But if there wasn't any need because it was self-explanatory, we didn't just because we were going yeah. crazy. Yeah. But sometimes, uh, you know, you sit there for hours and you think, what the heck can I say about this picture? Like I'm looking at this picture of uh, the Terran Emperor and there's this gorgeous picture of her that we use, you know, but what are you going to say about her? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I went back. There's no reason to caption it. Yeah. And I went back and I looked at some of the episodes. And when the, as soon as they rattle off her full title, I thought, perfect. And it takes up two lines of caption space. All hail the Emperor, Philippa Giorgio Augustus Eoponius Centaurius. My favorite um, comment on one of the review sites online 
Uh, this was about, I think the costume book that, that we wrote. And uh, th this commenter wrote, um, they should, there, there's too much writing. They should have just named the people in the pictures and left out all of that other gobbledygook. <laughs> and, you know, we spend a year writing okay. and it's gobbledygook. That's my favorite, <sighs> my favorite review. Some people are so rude. <laughs> yeah. They're trolls. Oh, well. There's trolls. Yeah, and, and it's the whole keyboard warrior, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. It, that's right. Well, everybody can be a, a star if they have a computer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, some of the things I noticed this book doesn't discuss are the extremely spacious turbo shafts aboard Discovery, as well as the majority of the show's Klingon ships, aside from the Cleave ship that shows a second style D7 class and the sarcophagus yeah. ship. How did you decide what to include and what to leave out? I think well, we never talked to anybody about those weird turbo lift shafts that look like mm -hmm. a roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the first time I saw it, I, I wasn't sure what we were seeing, you know, and then I went, oh, that's, right. that's the path that the turbo lift chain you know, takes. While we were writing, it never even occurred to me. I mean, you're asking me a question. If you had brought that up before, we probably would have, but it didn't pop into my head. Yeah. So, you know, if we had thought, okay, let's explain that to the audience, we'd have gone back to the person who designed it and who shot it, and we would have written something yeah. up, but it didn't occur to us because, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, and eventually, you know, we had enough words to fill up the book. We, I mean, <laughs> we stopped. We, we, and we stopped because, I mean, uh, Jonathan Frakes suggested that we talk to the cinematographer. He really liked the cameraman, but we didn't have a specific place to put it, and we ran out of space. Mm -hmm. We never got we never got around to it. It just, you know. But yeah. there, there, there's going to be more books, and you know, somebody will write them mm -hmm. even if yeah, it's not us. So you know, as for why or why not, it's usually about time and and if we've got enough information on it or if we actually even thought of asking that question. Yeah, but I thought of it, actually I should have thought of it because the turbo lifts have always sort of been a question in my mind. I mean, do they go up and down and this way and, you know, you can't- Yeah, according tell. to Discovery, they go all yeah. over the place. Well, yeah. Well, I, I was surprised that, you know, the, the, book, the book includes like a, a schematics of the, the Discovery's internal layout, and I was surprised the turbo shafts aren't pictured there for some reason. So. Well, <laughs> I think that's because the guy who designed it also didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as he said, um, he said he just drew the stuff because the directors were always asking him, where's this on the ship and where's that on the ship? If a director had ever said to him, where exactly are all those turbo shafts? He would have done it, you yeah, know, and he yeah. still might do it someday, you yeah. know, but it's it's just a matter of, did anybody ask? No, so. The fellow who drew the schematics of the ship said the director will come up and say, where is Saru's quarters from mm -hmm. the outside? And he said, well, we never even thought about it. So that he'll, well, he'll say, well, I want to bring the camera in through here and do that. So can you show me where? So he says he kind of, reshuffles the inside of the ship each time to satisfy the director's desires for for a camera movement i mean it, I, it's interesting i i don't remember if it's a page or two but i was glad to hear it so we wrote about it thank you very much to terry j urban and paul m block for joining us on the scotch tracker you bet uh, <laughs> we're on facebook and we're also on twitter um you know they could just on Facebook, they can just look up our names and we'll pop up. And yeah, we, we generally use our middle initials. Yeah. So that helps to find us. Yeah, but. and usually if they don't seem too insane, we'll accept them as friends, you know. I haven't had any trouble really. And with Twitter, you don't have to ask permission. You can just follow people. So with yeah. Twitter, um, if you just put our name in the search box, you'll find out what our handle on yeah. Twitter is. And then you can just follow us and throw in comments every now and then. Yeah, I'm an old goat, so I'm more of a Facebook guy than a Twitter guy. Twitter confuses me 
It, it, you know, it's, Paula will say she wrote something on Twitter, and I look, and I got to go, through, and it's a thousand entries down. It's, it's, you know, Facebook is generally right there, so I'm a Facebook I tell guy. them, use the search engine. <laughs> use the search box. So, but what can you do? Yeah. We're old, but we're happy. <laughs> That's what counts. I've really, really enjoyed just chatting and just I could listen to you for hours but thank you for the book thank you for your time this evening and um uh, yeah I'm definitely going to be stalking you both on Twitter I want to right. I want to see more of the I want I want just someone to write to me and just put patience afterwards so <laughs> <laughs> and it's so soothing you know <laughs> it is it is it is okay yeah okay. thanks very much okay you bet. thank you we had fun we can do it, please. Yeah. We did too.